welcome to the Simple Truth. We're in the book of Matthew, uh, studying that book. I hope you're enjoying the study and you're staying with me. Hope you got your Bibles out. Uh, I'm in the New King James, uh, and, and we'll go from there. Uh, we're in Matthew chapter 8. Uh, we're going to start with verse 18, but I'm gonna, I always back up a little bit and kind of tie in last week's program with this week's. Um, I'm just going to read part of, chat, of verse 17. And he himself took our infirmities and bore our sickness. Uh, Jesus did that for us. He did it at the cross. Uh, so we can look back to the cross and we can pray for healing, uh, not only for ourselves, but those that are around us. It, it ought to be a part of our prayer life uh, because Jesus said he's taken our infirmities. He's taken our sicknesses. He's taken all of our problems onto himself and that we have the right to ask for, uh, when we do wrong, forgiveness, uh, and when we are sick, to ask for healing. Uh, and, and the thing of it is, you and I need to believe it, receive it, and never doubt it. I've seen people getting healed, and then they started trying to analyze how they got healed and, and all that kind of stuff, and they have talked themselves out of it. I don't want you to do that. I want you to completely uh, receive, completely believe, and not ever doubt that, that you've received it because it's in part of the new covenant that Jesus has made with us from the cross and, and even before that, he, he, it was a part of the new covenant before when it was already decided back before the beginning of the earth when, when God had their uh, business meeting, you might say, and claimed healing for each one of us uh, in the New Testament because of what Christ did. His willingness to take our uh, sicknesses, our infirmities on himself. So now let's get started in this week's. Um, verse 18, and when Jesus saw a great multitudes about him, he began, he gave, he gave a commandment to depart on the other side. Uh, then a certain scribe came and said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, Birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their own dead. Now, what Jesus is bringing across here to us is, is when he told us, you know, the foxes don't have a hole, you know, uh, birds of the air have a nest. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, what he's saying is we have to be careful with today's society that, that we don't let stuff, things that we have, keep us from doing the work that God has called us to do. Uh, it's not wrong to have a home. It's not wrong to, to have, you know, um, a vehicle or any of that kind of stuff. Um, what he's saying is don't let those things hold you to where you're at so that you can't go where he wants you to go. Uh, it's very important that we are in God's will and not just let things hold us back. And then the next one he said, uh, follow him and let the dead bury their own. At that time, uh, if someone died, they buried them that day. It was not, you know, stretched out um, like what we do today. They, they didn't have embalming at the time, and therefore the body needed to be prepared and put into a, a tomb uh, very quickly. And so it usually was just a day thing. And so what he's saying is let those that are spiritually dead bury the physical dead. And you be about the will of God. Okay? Now, verse 23. Now, when he got into the, a boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with waves. But he was asleep. And then his disciples came to him and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We are perishing. Now, you know, I, I read these things like this, and I think, now, these are fishermen. These are, these are men who, who had been on the, on the 
uh, Sea of Galilee who had, uh, they, they knew of the storms that would be coming up on them and they were probably used to having them. And yet here, uh, this one was a mighty tempest because it was putting waves up over the top of the boat um, across the deck of it, which would be scary to me. But Jesus was at peace. He just was sound asleep and, and knew that he would be taken care of. Okay? But verse, verse 26. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked, rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the waves and the sea obey him? Jesus rebuked them as he, as he would a little child. Um, kind of no, no, no type thing, you know. Um, but, but here he's talking about their faith. If you would have faith in me, knowing that, that my father was going to take care of me, and you with me, and I will take care of you, then you wouldn't have been in such a turmoil and fear that you were in. And then when he, when he calmed the sea... Uh, he rebuked it, and that in the wind, and there was a great calm. It tells us that, that Christ had the power over nature, that even nature itself would obey what is being said by, by God. Uh, we have that source of praying for God's will in these situations when we have a, a, a bad storm uh, coming towards us to be able to pray and, and, and not only pray for protection, but also to pray that it won't be as bad as what's been reported to us. Uh, but we still need to take precautions. I, I want to understand that. You know, warnings are, are good. There are precautions we need to take. But it's always best saying, well, it wasn't quite as bad as we feared it would be after everything's over. So always be prepared. Uh, verse 28. And we had come to the, the other side to a country of Garginius. Uh, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tomb, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. Now, I want you to understand that, that there are demons in the world. They are evil spirits. Uh, I, I have several ideas of, of what they may come from, but, but that's Irrevenant. We just need to know they are there. Uh, they want to uh, possess men, women, because we are in the image of God. They have more uh, ability to do things, uh, to move, if they are possessing a human body. Uh, I want you to understand, I don't want you to go looking for it. I don't want you to go thinking there's a demon under every bush. Uh, that is not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that we need to recognize that they are, but we don't have to be afraid of them if we're in Christ. Because Jesus, who's in us, is greater than any of the demons or Satan that would come against us. So, let's go on. In verse 29. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come to torment us uh, before the time? Uh, now, what they're saying, now, what you understand, these demons in these two men recognized who Jesus was, recognized that he was the Son of God. Uh, demons can recognize who is in authority in your life. If you uh, go to Acts 19, I think it is, um, we have the, the contest there that... Um, they were seven sons of a chief priest who thought they could do the same thing Paul was doing because Paul was going out and, and casting out demons in the name of Jesus, and they thought that's what they could do. And, and the demons said, you know, Jesus we know. They knew the authority and the relationship with, with God the Father that he had. They understood that, that they said, Paul we know. Because they understood the relationship with Paul, with Christ, and therefore uh, to God the Father. But then they asked, 
who are you? Because they didn't see a relationship between Jesus and the Father. So, so they recognized authority, even authority over them uh, in, in people that are in relationship with Jesus and, and a close relationship. Uh, so let's go on. Now, a good way off from them, there was a herd of many swine feeding. So the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. So when they had come out, they went into a herd of swine, and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. Then those who kept them fled, and they went away into the city, and they told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to depart from their region. Now, isn't that strange? Here he just set two demonized men free from the demons. He had, he, they'd asked to... The demons here asked to go into the swine, the pigs, and Jesus said, go. At his word, it was done. Uh, understand, sometimes that's all it needs is just have a word from God that tells everything's going to be all right. But here, the whole city came out, even after the men who were watching the, the, you know, the, the swine decided to run to town and tell everybody, and they came out and looked, and they asked Jesus to depart. Now the, now, the strange thing here is, it wasn't about the two men being delivered. It was about the finance that was being lost, and they blamed Jesus for it. Instead of praising God for the, for the uh, deliverance, they were more interested in the finances. We have to be careful of that ourselves. Sometimes finances gets in our way of trying to do the right thing because that's what God's will is. And yet we sometimes argue with God. Been guilty of it in the past myself. Okay, chapter 9. <clears throat> so he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. Now his own city is where is Capernaum here uh, because that's where he made his headquarters. Uh, if you go to Israel today, uh, in Capernaum, you will find Peter's house. Uh, there is a church built over the top of it, a Catholic church. Um, um, so, so Jesus did about 40 different miracles in Capernaum, and yet um, many of them didn't believe. So, so let's go on to verse 2. Uh, then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. And at once some of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Now, I want, before we finish this verse, I want you to understand, Jesus knew their thoughts. Uh, this is, this is that spiritual gift of knowledge. Uh, something that you know without, without it being taught to you. He didn't hear them, but he knew their thoughts. Uh, so that's a gift of knowledge that's being uh, described out there. Uh, and, and it's possible for us to know things without us learning them uh, through the you know, the natural way of, of, of learning and experiencing. So let's, verse 4, But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or say, Arise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on the earth to forgive sin. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And he rose and departed to his house. Uh, now, when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God who had given such power to men. Now, notice we have no idea here of what the paralegic's faith was. 
But you notice back at the beginning of that in verse 2, when Jesus saw their faith, the friend's faith that brought the paraplegic to him, uh, sometimes it's not the person that being healed has the faith, but those who are around him, his friends in this case. Uh, it can be a group of, of believers around a person that, that can pray and believe without doubt that someone's going to be healed and it will happen. Uh, it is part of, of one of the ways that we, and, and, and I want you to understand there's, there's many ways of, of doing things. Uh, but you need to have the Holy Spirit to guide you of what you need to say and what you need to do so that you're in God's will and you're being obedient and you're believing without doubt. Have your faith strong in belief. Okay. Um, you know, in verse 8, some of them glorified God and, and, and that God had given such power to men. Well, to Christ right now in, at this time. But it comes to the rest of us later if we will believe. And we will accept it. Verse 9, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he rose and followed him. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Um, now, it really doesn't say, but we only assume that, that when Jesus called Matthew from the tax office here, um, that he went home with him. Okay? But then there was other tax collectors because, because they were hated by the Jews. You know, uh, <clears throat> hated paying taxes like we do today. So they didn't have anyone else to fellowship with or spend time with, but other tax collectors. So they would meet together. Um, and so Jesus and his disciples are with them. Now verse 11, And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Notice he said, well, people don't need a doctor, only sick people. They need the healing. Verse 13, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, please understand in the Old Testament, this was a new concept to them because in the Old Testament, it was always about the ritual, always about the sacrifice, the, the shedding of blood of, a, of an animal. And yet, God has always wanted mercy as your sacrifice and not a physical uh, animal being killed, uh, an innocent animal uh, being killed. And here, if you know what mercy means, it simply means, you know, receiving, you know, not getting what you deserve. Mercy means not getting what you deserve. We all deserve God's wrath because we didn't know who he was. We didn't, at a time in our lives, we didn't accept his son. Uh, and so when we accept Jesus Christ, it is uh, the mercy of God and the grace of God, which is, not receiving what we should have received, which was his judgment, but receiving grace, which is receiving what we don't deserve. It's that ultimate love that God poured out for you and me. Uh, and, he, and he tells them, you know, learn from this. Understand what I'm saying here. Uh, I didn't come for the righteous, those that was righteously believing in God and following in Him and doing His will, seeking His will, but for sinners to repent. In other words, um, you and I were, if we're not now, we were at some time a sinner, and it took repentance to set us up to meet Jesus who could save us. And it's important that we understand that He came for the sinners, which... Basically, we're all, we're 
sinners at a time if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior now. now let's go on. Verse 14. Uh, then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friend of a bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the day will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunken cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and the tear is made worse. Nor do you put new wine in an old wineskin, or else the wineskin breaks, the wine is spilled, and the wineskin are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Okay, now, on the idea of fasting, I want you to know there's no set fast length, time, what to fast. Uh, there is. Uh, we know of times when it's been for a day. Uh, I know of times when it's just for a meal. I know times it's just for a thing. Um, it, it, but Jesus also and others have, have fasted for 40 days. So there's not a time limit on it, but it's something that, that we should apply to our life because it brings the body into subjection. It, we're not living by appetite alone, but by the will of us over our own bodies. Uh, it is a, a practice that we should be a part of. At this time, he was saying, I'm with my disciples right now, so they don't have to fast because I'm with them. But there will be a time when they will need to fast, just as the Jews uh, fasted. Uh, uh, more times than not, they did it in the idea of, of look at me, look at me, where the idea of a fast is not to let anyone else know that that's what you're doing. Or at least, you know, doesn't make a big show out of it. So, and then he goes on and he talks about old wineskins and, and new wineskins. He, he's talking about, we, we have to be born again have a change of, of wants so that we can follow the scriptures and his commandments that Jesus gives to us in his word, like what we're studying today, so that we, as a new creature, because we've accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, can contain the words of of his grace towards us, his righteousness, his love for us, and the understanding that comes with those things. The wisdom of God can be put in it. Uh, you talk about old wineskins, well, they're, they're dry, they're, you know, um, they've been used, so there's, there's uh, leftover uh, uh, ferment in them. Uh, and he's talking about they don't give like what a new one did. And that, that's what we need to do. We need to be stretching more uh, than what we used to be. Okay, And so to, to do that, we have to be born again. We have to come into knowing Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and follow after Him. And we become a new creature so that the new word, this new wine He's talking about, which is the Word of God, can be in you and me, and we can follow Him. Now, uh, and we can be preserved. I mean, we can have eternal life out of this. Uh, verse 18, While He spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped Him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hands on her, and she will leave. So Jesus rose and followed Him, and so did His disciples. Now, that's the start of one story, but here right in the middle of the story, we have something else that happens. And, and listen to this, verse 20. And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, If only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. 
But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was well from that hour. <coughs> now, I, there's so much going on in this particular little series. You know, if she had an issue of blood, she was not supposed to be around other people because she would have been considered unclean. But when she reached out and, and touched the hem of his garment, and it's really, I always thought the robes were round, they're not, they're kind of rectangle, and so they have a tassel on each corner. Well, these tassels are usually white, but they have a real dark blue, beautiful blue thread in them. And that thread was to always remind not only the one wearing the robe, but also those who saw him that to rely on the word of God, that it was a, a picture of that. And in the Old Testament it says that healing is in the wings. Okay, well the wings of a garment would be the corners. And that's where these white, this white thread was. So her faith was, all I got to do is just touch them. Just touch one of them and I'll be healed. And that's great faith. And that's the kind of faith that you and I need to have as we... Uh, live our lives as we pray for other people, as we present the gospel to other people, is that we believe in the Word of God and that it has the healing power to change lives. Not only physically, but spiritually, so that we become one in Him. So, we just need to have that kind of faith. That, that it's a childlike faith. Uh, how many times, it, you know, if a child's standing on a chair presenting and you say, just jump in my arms, they don't hesitate. They just jump because they know that mom or dad or whoever it is is going to catch them. And that's the kind of childlike faith that he's talking about. That's the kind of childlike faith that you and I need to have. And yet, even though we are given a measure of faith, we are to exercise it. And exercising it is to experience in Christ, to experience in the many things that he has for us and, and to do what he's called us to do, even if it doesn't sound like a sensible thing to do. But it always is. God has a plan. He has a plan for your life, the same he has a plan for my life. And we should be living it to the fullest and bring joy not only to ourselves, not only to the people around us, but above all, to God our Father through Jesus Christ as we go on. Uh, we'll finish this story next week. Uh, it's not over yet. God bless you. We'll see you next week and continue to pray for the peace.